the Historical Society. I always want to introduce our leadership before anything else. We're a volunteer organization. Helen Wilson, one of our vice presidents, is at the mission, one of the machines. Uh, we have uh, three, three, I think, board members here. Audrey Glickman at the other machine. We have Ralph Lund over here as a board member, and Wayne Bossinger in the back as a board member. And, uh, and Gene Beanstock was here and had to leave uh, back there. And uh, Betty Connolly, our other vice president, has just walked in. Hi, Betty. Okay, welcome. Um, we've been around here for about 18 years doing this stuff. We, we, we love having these talks. You have on your chair uh, a list of the talks to Mi come. Microphone. And uh, one of them, um, one, the next one, very interesting, Eric Lidgey who is from the Rao Jewish Archives, and some of you may know because he's been working with Tree of Life and, uh, in terms of the recovery effort, and he's been gathering artifacts of uh, the disaster there to put in the Rao Archives. But Eric has come in to talk about Gene Kelly. We wanted to have Gene Kelly talked about for a long time. He's from the East End, and that'll be in May. In uh, June, we're going to have an interesting talk yeah, by Preservation Pittsburgh on a fountain in Shenley Park. In uh, July, the, uh, we're having to check the dates, but the poetry workshop, the Squirrel Hill Poetry Workshop, which has been around for 40 years, is coming. So look for those programs. Come see us. The, the most immediate next thing is that we're having a walking tour of the Squirrel Hill Business District on Saturday, May 4th. We're meeting right out here. It's from about 9.45 to 12. We did one last year, but this year we're going to focus almost exclusively on what was along Forbes and Murray in the 1970s and 1980s. We just walk and talk about the different places. We featured particularly what was called the Fashion Center which was all the clothing stores in the 1970s. So we have sign-up sheets for that in the back, uh, or you can take one with you if you're not quite sure. So please do join us for that. Um, our speaker tonight, our speakers are from the Dollar Savings Bank. It's, Dollar's been around the neighborhood a lot longer than any of us, and uh, we want to get them to come in and talk. And our speakers this evening, Joseph Smith, who's the Senior Vice President of Marketing, <laughs> and Dorothy Spangler, who's a multimedia production specialist. Mr. Smith has been involved with Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, T. Rose Prize Mutual Funds, Golden West Financial, At Atlas Mutual Funds, World Savings, a graduate of Princeton who comes as an MBA from Pittsburgh, uh, U, and lives in Mount Lebanon. Dorothy is a multimedia uh, production specialist. She is the historic specialist of Dollar Bank, graduate of Duquesne University. She came here from LA, uh, where she worked in TV. And Dorothy, I understand, is from Newcastle and has uh, come down here to speak this evening, which we very much appreciate. So I don't know who's going to start, but take the podium. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. You know, Michael's a tough guy because uh, I'm, I'm somewhat a procrastinator and I can tell you he was good to hunt me down and getting Dorothy and I to send out the information. But we're very happy to be here tonight. Squirrel Hill actually was our first branch in 1964. As a savings bank, we were governed by laws that did not allow us to branch until the 1960s. And uh, Squirrel Hill was our very first branch and it's right where it used to be. I know we've upgraded a little bit, but... Uh, there's nothing like being in, in Squirrel Hill, and it's been one of our uh, longest, it is our longest standing branch. We now have 70 branches. We have 32 in the Pittsburgh region, 29 in uh, Cleveland. In 1984, we had the opportunity to go to Cleveland and take over for a bank that had failed. And uh, so we've been there since 1984. And then as recently in 2017, we had an opportunity to merge with a uh, 
bank in Virginia Beach, of all places. Uh, and so now we have uh, four branches, soon to have eight branches in Virginia Beach. So if any of you go to Virginia Beach, you go through that tunnel, and you come out of the tunnel and you're in Norfolk, everything to the sea is where Dollar Bank's branches are, because we're, we're only in that little area. And then we also merged in uh, 2017 with Progressive Federal that was in uh, Dormont and Allentown. Uh, we're a mutual bank. I used to be able to say we're America's largest mutual bank, but in uh, 2018, we converted to a mutual holding company. So now we are the uh, third largest mutual entity in America. I will tell you that we're still the purest because uh, the bank in Boston and the bank in Ohio that are also mutual holding companies have made a lot of people wealthy with their stock. We have issued zero stock and intend to not issue any stock because we believe um, the purest form of banking is to be a mutual bank and to be a community bank. You may um, not know it, but we're the largest URA lender in Pittsburgh. So when it comes to um, providing homes for people, uh, particularly low to moderate income, we have really five key building blocks we look at. Um, home ownership certainly is key. I mean, that's our bread and butter. But education, uh, helping those that are less fortunate, the quality of life issues. So, for example, we sponsor the um, Dollar Bank Three Rivers Arts Festival. And many of you may know the history. That was owned uh, by the uh, Carnegie Museum for years in for the women's club there. And when it was failing, um, the Cultural Trust came in. And I just happened to be with Kevin McMahon on the Cultural Trust. And they didn't figure out how they could make it work. And Steve Hansen was our CEO at that time. And he said, well, this is a treasure. Everybody comes to Pittsburgh. We have half a million people a year. So we kind of stepped up and agreed to be the stage sponsor. Uh, I think that was somewhere around 2005 or 2006. And we've subsequently grown to be the title sponsor. But it's a wonderful event. Um, we also do things like we sponsor the films every night all summer long for the city of Pittsburgh. Um, we do you know, our Mortgage for Mothers program. How many are familiar with the Mortgage for Mothers program? That's a program that you need to be a low to moderate income. It doesn't have to be women. We've done more just for men, but men aren't nearly as dependable as women. You know? <laughs> you know, and, and, um, so we have placed over 3,500 women into their own homes since 1995. And 2,500 of those have been in the city of Pittsburgh, the other thousands. But, and that's quite a testament to what mutuality means. So tonight what we want to do is we kind of want to briefly walk you through we are the oldest bank in Pittsburgh, and I have a story to tell you about that. Um, but we kind of want to walk you through our history. Dorothy, who's our, even though she's the multimedia specialist that we hired from Disney, she's a heck of a storyteller and likes to be a historian. So she's going to really do the lion's share of the work today. Um, no pun intended. That, no, it's right. <laughs> I'm going to tell you some stories about the lion, too. But um, why don't we start, Dorothy? And this chart kind of shows how old we are. You know, when you think the telegraph was 1844, uh, the P Pittsburgh Cleveland Railroad, 1853, there we are in 1855. Now, Charles Colton, well, let me finish that, 1861 Civil War. By the way, our Fourth Avenue branch uh, was not built until 1870 because we had lent money to the Union Army. And our board of directors was quite concerned about building a bank that if the Confederates had won, we wouldn't have known where we were. So that's the end. If you look at when we bought the property versus when we built the building, it correlates with the Civil War, which is another interesting story. Charles Colton was from Connecticut. And we all know the, the lion's share of mutual banks in America are in, are in New England. And after 1989, when we had the, the uh, major savings and loan crisis with Charles Keating, uh, something, a concept called capital was introduced to savings and loans and thrifts, which we were. And 75% of the mutual fund industry died between 1989 and 1995. Wow. And that's because they couldn't raise capital from retained earnings. So they chose to be either merged with a stock-based bank or to cash out and let somebody acquire them. Our leader at that time was a fellow named Steve Hansen, and he really felt that uh, Dollar Bank needed to maintain its mutuality, and we really knuckled down. and. Uh, by 1993, we had made our capital requirement. We now have uh, one of the highest capital ratings in America. So, and I have, if you should be so interested, 
for all of you, our statement of financial condition, <laughs> which, um, which really talks about our, our capital ratios, our, our safety and soundness. Um, but he came from uh, New England. And when he came to Pittsburgh, there were 10 banks. They all supported corporations. There wasn't a single bank for a working man or woman. So Dollar Bank, as you can maybe read here, you want to go back to Charles Coleman? How do we get so far ahead here? Okay. The bank was organized in order to provide a place where laboring people and women and children who have neither the knowledge nor opportunity to invest their money could leave it in safety and have it invested for their benefit. By the way, up until about 1940, we paid an average return on a savings account of 6%. Wouldn't we like that today? Okay. That's what we did. So, so that's our founder. And every time they need a look-alike of Charles Colton, I get to put a talk out on the game. <laughs> so I get to do it. Next. Uh, oldest bank in Pittsburgh. If any of you, I mean, this is, I have an article here from 2002, Post-Gazette from Patty Sabatini, who's still there. Uh, PNC, and we're very good friends with PNC, so I'm not, I don't mean to pick on them. But they announced their 150th birthday party. Now, the head of marketing at Dollar Bank says, how could that happen? We're 147 years old, we're the oldest bank. So I called the Post-Gazette, I talked to Dave Bayhoff, who at that time was the president, and I said, Dave, this is not right. They're not 150 years old. So he called John Craig, everybody remember John Craig? He was the managing editor for years. And John Craig gave the Patty Sabatini the task to prove it. So she calls uh, uh, PNC and, and a fella there, said he was quite perplexed. Um, as to why they're not 150, they date back to 1852 on, on Wood Street. So um, Patty Sabatini calls it my boss at the time, Jeff Morrow, and he said, well, how could that be? We have the oldest continuous charter. They don't have the oldest continuous charter. So then Patty goes to John Craig and says, I don't know what to say. They both sound legitimate to me. So she gets a prof he gets a professor from Pitt and a professor from CNU and said, who's the oldest bank in Pittsburgh? And it was us. So Dollar Bank had crowned the oldest, and they didn't run their 150th anniversary, so, uh, so we confirmed that. Um, First Mutual Bank in Pittsburgh, uh, our presence on 4th Avenue has been there since uh, 1855. Our birthday is July 19th, so um, we always try to celebrate a little bit when we get there. Um, the building was constructed in 1870, it opened uh, in 1871. And I'm going to tell you a story a little later about the mistake that was made after the flood of 1936 and what we've had to do over the last uh, really um, 10 years to preserve that building. Uh, it has here open on Monday, April 3rd, uh, continuous on an operative dollar bank. We have a heritage center there right now. And I really encourage all of you that have, like history, to come down to the heritage center. Um, we have kept every ledger since we opened in 1855 well. until we became whatever the technology was that came in that did away with ledgers. But we have also um, digitized every ledger. But it's amazing. You can walk through, and Dorothy has done a presentation in 4th Avenue that lets you walk through the, the uh, immigrants that came to Pittsburgh. So you see the Irish, you see the Polish, you see the Scandinavian, you see the German. And, and the history and the names and when they've come, we have a wonderful display there that talks about that. But we're a mutual bank, so we were open always to every single person. And we have a display on there, our first African-American customer. By the way, he lived on Wiley Avenue, about a block from our founder, Charles Cole. Uh, we have our first female depositor. And here's an interesting thing that Mr. Colton did. Uh, coming from uh, New England, he believed that the women's rights were equal to the man, men's rights. And back in 1855, if you got married as a woman, anything you owned went to your husband. In our passbook of 1855, it says that that is the sole property of the owner of that passbook, male or female. So he was way ahead of his time. Mike. So it's interesting, a number of this group spent Saturday morning on Wiley Avenue on a historic tour of the Hill District. Of the churches? Pardon was me? it of the churches or not? Just the Wiley Avenue? Yeah. Just okay, because we did sponsor that church tour that was mainly in the Hill District. Ride with the King. Ride with the King. The Mar on Martin Luther King Day. Are you talking about the churches later? Uh, that's part of, uh, that's where I start. Okay, good. We have a nice story about the churches too. 
Anyway, this kind of shows our doors were open, and they are to this day to anybody. And, and, and they always have been. What do we have next? You can see she did this presentation. Um, it's very interesting. Um, more than a third of Dollar Bank's customers from 1855 to the 1920s were immigrants. But that was Pittsburgh's time. You know, that was the industrial <coughs> era starting. We couldn't find enough labor. Terribly ironic, that's the same, same situation we're in today. We cannot find enough workers. Uh, Dollar Bank, uh, we printed passports in German. It's I ironic, the bank we merged with, or actually acquired in 1984 in Cleveland, started out as a German savings bank. So we have their history from 1896. Uh, that just shows you, we have a Chinese signature from 1888, a Hebrew signature from 1889, and a German signature from 1893. And if you look at our ledger books, they will talk about had a scar in his left cheek, walked with a limp, because there was no photography. But you still, just like today, had to verify who it was you were dealing with. What do we have next? That's me. Ah, now you're really going to get the true, the right story. Quite true, but different. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting us tonight. I wanted to talk about, as a community bank, Dollar Bank's role in really growing up with the city. One of the aspects of Dollar Bank's support for the community has traditionally been uh, funding houses of worship for communities of faith. One of the very first, um, and these are contained in our cash books and trustee minutes, how do we know who has banked with us? We have a complete set of handwritten ledgers, as Joe mentioned, going back to 1855. But we also have, in addition to the customer ledgers, we have trustee minutes and we have cash books. And the cash books were the daily operating expenses of the bank. Cash coming in, cash going out. So when we made a loan or a mortgage, it was entered in the cash books. And I could go back into the cash books, into the digital forms or the real forms, and find who who was getting the loans from us. And one of the very first loans of a religious community of faith for their building was to Road of Shalom, which was entered, curiously enough, they spelled it Road of Sholem, S-H-O-L-E-M at the time, in our cash book. But that was for the 1862 building, uh, which I believe cost $50,000, was the total construction budget, and it was um, on 8th Street, so it was, it was before the Squirrel Hill building, but that um, we made a $5,000 loan, so about 10% of the project budget was, uh, was a loan from us, mortgage. And you can see I just picked a few examples, but really all over the region, not just the city of Pittsburgh, but other counties, um, Franklin, PA, we funded churches there. So our reach in terms of... Uh, funding houses of worship is all over western Pennsylvania and very important for communities and especially a growing region like Pittsburgh was at the time. One of the institutions or organizations that we've always supported has been the Sisters of Mercy. If any of you know that the history of the sisters, they were here before Dollar Bank was. The first seven sisters arrived in Pittsburgh in 1843. It took them a month to cross the Atlantic from Ireland in a ship called the Queen of the West. They docked in New York. It took them two weeks by stagecoach to get from New York to Pittsburgh. When they arrived here, there were very few paved roads. There was not a hospital. There was no professional nursing service. Their first year, they Built, they spent um, building schools and getting schools started for, for students. But the bishop at the time, who was the first bishop of the Diocese of Pittsburgh, Bishop O'Connor, realized the need, the grave need for a hospital. And the sisters opened Mercy Hospital on January 1st, 1847. The very next year, February of 1848, the city was struck by a typhus epidemic. And four of the sisters died having contracted the disease while nursing other people. So the selflessness of the Sisters of Mercy really became quite legendary very early on. And 
their existence and their survival as an order being able to do what they do was really touch and go for years. So them getting buildings and funding was really, really critical. Um, in 1869, uh, one of their schools burned. That's why they needed another loan there. Um, I don't know what the 1884 loan was for, but the 1916 one was for the expansion of Mercy Hospital. They bought the property around Stevenson Street um, very early on in, I think that one opened around 1848 or 9, but uh, they, they really needed to upgrade and modernize in 1916. So our loan to them for $450,000 was a very large percentage of that whole project budget. This is what some of those old ledgers look like. And for those of you who are, who may know about uh, official preservation methods, this isn't how they are stored, thank goodness. <laughs> the, the books are not stacked and sitting on top of one another. Uh, this was our first uh, method when we took them out of, out of the storage in Green Tree, and we now have them at Brady's Bend in climate-controlled conditions where each book has its own shelf. So they're, they're very, very well preserved. And uh, all the stories that we tell you, all the information that we give you, we're able to do that because we have access to these records and a real complete picture of what was going on in the bank at the time. So who are some of our customers who lived in Squirrel Hill? Well, since you're the Squirrel Hill Historical Society, I think you probably know more about your community than I do. One of the main uh, pictures, one of the main uh, facts that looked out at me as I was doing research on these customers was when Squirrel Hill really got its start as a residential community as opposed to farms, because that's what it really was at first, was farmland. And here's an 1872 map uh, over on the left that very large parcel belongs to Shenley. And towards the right, um, you'll see some of the people that we're going to talk about. The Suckup Farm was uh, owned by um, Ernest Suckup and his daughter Annie at age 13 came to Dollar Bank in 1868 to open a savings account. Interestingly enough, at the time, there were no laws prohibiting minors from opening savings accounts without their parents. So a lot of kids did that. They would come in as school kids and, and open, open savings accounts. And Annie, um, if you look at that day's uh, opening, account openings, nobody else from her family or from Squirrel Hill was in there with her. <laughs> so it appears she came in all on her own to downtown opened her savings account, and uh, banked with us. So you see on the map there, uh, Ernest's Farm, and that's a, an 1872 map with some of the street names from 1890 filled in, and the street names changed a few times over the next years, over the next few years after that. So the 1890 map um, shows that he sold the northernmost part of his farm to J.W. Geyer, then by 1903, he'd sold the remainder to the Forward Land Company. So that was the June 1900 Pittsburgh Post, uh, recorded that as 11.5 acres, which he sold for $85,000. So that's the price of, price of Squirrel Hill Land in 18, 1890, or in 1900. Another farm and another customer was Sydney Ann English. She was the daughter of Thomas English and she opened her account with us in 1869. So in our ledgers, which is how we know who lived in Squirrel Hill, in our ledgers, they, they would ask you your name, your age, your occupation, where you were born, and where you lived. And at this time, 1868 and 1869, they wrote Squirrel Hill. There weren't a lot of streets in the, in, in the Squirrel Hill district back then. So people didn't necessarily say, I live on this and such a street. They would just say Squirrel Hill, and that's what was written down in our ledgers. So Sydney in English. Then you can see in 1890, the map, um, the farm is still in the English family's hands. That's connected to English Way, by the way. So that, that place name takes its, 
takes its provenance from the English farm. And by 1903, Henry Clay Frick owns those 35 acres, 38 acres, I think. Another Squirrel Hill resident, early Squirrel Hill resident, was James Phelan. He was an Irish immigrant, came to the United States at age nine by himself. <laughs> Can you imagine? So he was born in 1830, came to the United States in 1839, stayed with an uncle in Philadelphia. When he was a teenager, he moved to Pittsburgh. By age 20, he started his own store in downtown Pittsburgh on Fifth Avenue. That would have been 1850. And he ran that store of men's attire, shirts, hats, clothing. Uh, he ran that store for the next 50 years. And it was the same location for all those 50 years. He made a, he made a great success. He handed the store over to his sons when he retired. And he lived uptown at first um, until around the turn of the century, around 1900, Squirrel Hill began to take on a more residential neighborhood uh, description. And Mr. Phelan was one of the early residents of Bartlett Street. He had a telephone number, Highland 945J. <laughs> Another Squirrel Hill resident, Abraham Israel DeRoy. The DeRoy family, I found probably a good six or seven members. It was a large extended family that had cousins as well, so it wasn't just one, one branch of the family. There were multiple branches of the family. And Abraham Israel DeRoy was the son of Israel and Catherine DeRoy. And you can see his address sort of changing over the years to reflect. Um, in 1900, he lived on Linden Avenue. 1910, Stratford. By 1916, he lived on Darlington Road, and then towards the end of his life, he lived in Moorwood Gardens, which became a dormitory, did it, yeah. for, for Carnegie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in 1929, I think it was brand spanking new because I found ads in the paper talking about all the amenities. So he would have moved in right when it was built and brand new. We also have found two of the four Kaufman brothers. We can't rule out the other two. We just know the two that we found. Uh, mind you, in that big collection of books that you saw, that collection of accounts from 1855 up through the 1920s reflects over 400,000 savings accounts that were opened in those years. So I'm so far the only person at the bank who's actually going through indexing these <laughs> it's it's kind of like chipping away at an iceberg, and we found a lot of people. So when people ask me, do you know so-and-so banked with you? I said, well, I can't rule them out, but if I run across them, I can tell you that they did. So this right now is for me to say, um, we have definitely found and positively identified two of the four brothers who co-founded Kaufman's. There were four altogether, Jacob, Henry, Morris, and Isaac. We have found... Morris, and Jacob. Uh, Jacob was the first of the brothers to come over from Germany, and as soon as he got some money as a peddler, he sent for his brother Isaac, and then the two other brothers, uh, Morris and Henry, followed two years after that. So they started out selling on the south side, then they opened a store on the north, and then ultimately they moved downtown, and that store is the one that we know as Kaufman's on Smithfield and uh, the Iconic store. Um, but both Morris and Jacob opened accounts with us uh, in the 1888 and 1890, and Jacob's, was, Jacob's accounts were in trust for his two, two, his two sons. The Kaufman's lived on the north side at first. Uh, Jacob and Morris lived two streets away from each other on um, Sheffield and, I um, can't remember the name of it, but at any rate, they, uh, the, the family was not only close, but physically close to each other, and uh, Morris bought into property at Squirrel Hill in the 1890s. As of 1894, in the direct Pittsburgh director, he was still living on North Side, but he bought land, um, six acres, six and a half acres near Shady and Phillips uh, in the later, in, in 1892, 
And then on a separate piece of property, he built a house for $75,000 on Forbes and Whiteman. So you can get a sense of how successful Kaufman's, the store, was by that time. And that's, that house had stables and um, was a very grand estate. And he moved up from there. <laughs> so in 1905, he bought the Fraunheim estate. Fraunheim's were an old German Pittsburgh family who were Brewers. Um, the grandfather Fraunheim started Iron City. So the Fraunheim estate was a huge house. Um, it had riding stables. It had um, something like 17, 17 rooms. Um, it had a 250 capacity ballroom. It was really, really posh and cost him $188,000. Now, mind you, our Fourth Avenue building, built in 1870, cost us 190,000 to build. So just to give you a comparative budget there, so that's a lot of money. And Morris's son, you might know him, E.J. Kaufman, as the one who commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright to do Falling Water. Mm. So E.J. grew up in this lap of really fine houses and architecture which imprinted on him a love for architecture and culture and the arts. And he turned Kaufman's, the downtown store, he really turned that into not just a place of commerce, but a place of culture as well. The picture that you see him there, the panel work behind him, he's sitting in his office at Kaufman's department store and that panel work was designed, his office was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, same as the architect for Falling Water. That office is now in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So EJ was quite a cultured man and grew up surrounded by fine culture and what Morris wanted to give him. Was Morris the uh, surviving, did he buy out his brothers in the Hoffman store? All four of them were involved. Jacob, who was the oldest, was the first to pass away in 1905. Henry was the last surviving one. So Jacob passed away in 1917. I'm not sure when Isaac passed away. But all of them were involved in the store. Yeah, but I, think, I think there was a Post-Gazette article four or five, hey, four or five mm -hmm. issue two or three years ago in February. And I thought one of the brothers bought the rest of them out. I'm not sure about that. Um, when when Jacob died in 1905, uh, he actually had had an, an operation for appendicitis. Um, I think it was in Philadelphia, but he never really recovered from that a few months later. But when he passed away, I think he was described as one of the, one of the leaders of Kaufman's store. So he may have been, and Edgar took over, obviously, um, later on, in, the, in a few decades later. So it definitely passed through family hands. So there's, what was interesting to me was that after moving from the north side where they lived two streets away from each other, they moved to Squirrel Hill and they were still two streets away from each other. <laughs> so for working together all the time, um, they were a family who obviously enjoyed having each other nearby. Another Squirrel Hill resident was Mary McGee Scaife. Like the Kaufmans, she started out living on the north side on Western Avenue. Then she moved to um, Moorwood Avenue in the 20s and then rented a home on Aylesboro Avenue in the 1930s. And I was trying to figure out what the connection was. And the woman who owned the house was uh, into the, uh, she was an equestrian. And Mary's son, who married Cordelia Mellon, was also into horse competitions, so that was the connection there. But Mary Scaife, uh, Mary McGee Scaife, came from the McGee family in Pittsburgh. Her father, Frederick, was a lawyer. Her uncle, Christopher McGee, was the founder of McGee Women's Hospital, which he dedicated to his mother, Elizabeth Steele McGee Women's Hospital. She married into the Scaife family, which was a couple of generations of industrial uh, metal industry. They'd been here, the Scaife Company had been here in one way, one shape or form since 1802, so a very early Pittsburgh family. 
Her son, Alan, married, as I said, Cordelia Mellon, and she, Mary McGee Scaife, was the grandmother of Richard Mellon Scaife and Cordelia Cordy Scaife Bay. Were the McGees also related to uh, David Lawrence? I think that... Could, could you repeat his comment? Cause... Oh, okay. He asked if um, the McGees were related to... David Lawrence. David L. Lawrence. Mayor David L. Lawrence. I think there was a marriage somewhere, as, I'm, as I've been... The, the McGees were also a political family and had been quite prominent at the beginning of the 1900s. So there may have been a McGee who married into Lawrence. Is there, the McGee family had the franchise to do the Belgian block in the city of, in the Allegheny County. Mm -hmm. And their operation was out near the Highland Bridge. So they owned land in, in well, Highland? They, they produced the Belgian block for all the streets. Okay. And it was through David, David L. Lawrence they had that. Okay. So, going from Mary McGee Scaife to women at Dollar Bank, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Dollar Bank's um, attitude towards women as customers. One of the things that really surprised me when I started going into our ledgers is a lot more women banked and had their own accounts than I would have thought. I mean, because you continuously hear, women couldn't open bank accounts. Well, at our bank they could. And not only single women, but married women. And you'll see uh, through the 1800s and the early 1900s, the percentage of women who banked with us each year as new customers rose and rose and rose. But by the time you reach 1918, 63% of our customer, new customers that year were women. So it, it's really a, an interesting cultural snapshot as well that you see women getting work and having income and needing to bank it somewhere. And female depositors in 1888, that was a year that I just, I surveyed several months out of it to see what did women list as their status. 61% um, were married, 18% were single, 6.9% were widowed, 9.2% were employed outside the home, and schoolgirls. 4.5%. Uh, One of the things that Dollar Bank did um, in our charter was that we recognized the property rights of married women. Now, in Pennsylvania law, because these laws on women's property rights went state by state, in 1848, Pennsylvania passed a law recognizing the estates of married women, which is to say the property that they took into a marriage. In 1872, they then passed a law recognizing the separate earnings of married women. So there was a gap there of 24 years where um, between a woman getting married, what she brought into the marriage, and what she earned, she could, she could legally retain control of what she brought into the marriage, but as soon as she got married, until 1872, as soon as she got married, she no longer controlled that money. What's interesting to me is that and here's an example of it. In our ledgers, uh, when a woman signed her name, frequently a married woman would sign her husband's name. I'm Mrs. John Baker. Well, according to the bank, she owned that account. So we would have her cross out the husband's name and say, I'm Alberta Baker, <laughs> okay? It's because she had her own identity and she needed to have her name on the account. So that's actually what we have. That name there is Carrie Oppenheimer, Carrie Carolyn Clee Oppenheimer. And she started to write Mrs. Saul Oppenheimer because that was her husband's name. And we had her cross that out and she wrote Mrs. Carrie Oppenheimer. So there it is on our charter, section nine from 1855. And we actually have the original copy of our 1855 charter in our archives. It shall not be lawful for the husband or the creditors of the husband of such married woman to attach or in any manner interfere with any deposit, interest, or dividend thereon to such married woman. We had some women who were small businessmen running their own businesses. So they could actually bank that money with us uh, between 
as I said, that gap of 24 years between 1848 and, and 1872, obviously we started in 1855, but women could come in, married women could come in, put the money in the account, and it was theirs. Another thing that surprised me was not just women being the managers of the household money, but sometimes husbands and wives would come in on the same day and open accounts right after one another. That was, that was really cool, too, to see that. Um, because it kind of gives you a, a, a sense of the relationship in that marriage as well, you know. There was a, a black preacher I was thinking of, um, Jesse, Jesse Coles, who came in with his wife, and he had her open her account first, and then he went. So I was like, there's a real gentleman. Okay. <laughs> So going from the women account holders at, at the bank, I'm going to turn it back over to Joe because we then bridge into the modern era and, and the program for putting women into houses. Try to round of applause for your <laughs> You know, every time I go over and talk to Dorothy during the day, I'll say, what did, what did you find today? And, she, uh, she's, and we also have... Um, An archivist. We have. We we had. We we felt we we started down this that we probably needed to actively continue not only to preserve what the bank had, which you've seen, but what the bank is doing now. So we now have a full time archivist at, at Dollar Bank, which is a little different. I kind of touched on this in my introductory remarks. The mortgages from others, but we on on uh, May 11th this year we'll have a mortgage from others. We will have over 500 women, maybe as many as 600 women, in the convention center. And it's a bit of hard, you know, it's, it, if you want to be somebody who has credit problems, is working, and wants a home, we are the only bank in the city that has a credit counseling arm, and we will, you have to want to do it, because it's hard work. Out of those 500 women, we'll be really happy to get 50 to 75 of them. But we do this a couple times a year. We do it in Cleveland. We're now doing it in Virginia. And as I mentioned, over the, uh, since 1995 we've been doing this, um, we've put over 35 women into housing. And we also have a program, once again, the community bank issue, the mutual bank issue. If they save $3,000 in that year, they get their credit cleaned up, they're now lendable, we give them $3,000. So it's called the 321 mortgage. But if they save 1000 we match a thousand. They save two thousand. We match two thousand. So it allows them to get their down payment and get some sorted. And the biggest issue. Think about where most initially, not so much anymore. But Section Eight housing. How many, how many people are familiar with Section Eight housing? Okay, you come in your W two form every year, and your rent changes based on your earnings. So there were any number of women that were in a two or three bedroom um, Section Eight housing in Pittsburgh. Think about this. And, and back in 1995, paying 800 to $1,000 in rent every month. Think about how that translates to the mortgage. Well. So if you can get these people cleaned up and you can get them confident, that's the other big piece of what mortgage mothers us. It makes them feel like they can do it. You know, and so we've had a great success on that. Um, okay, preserving dollar bank's history. I just, here I'm gonna make a little bit of a turn for Dorothy. But the flood of 1936, can you imagine we're on the corner of Smithfield and 4th Avenue. Our building was 14 feet underwater. And you know, that would never happen today. I mean, we get the Mon, Mon War flooded, it's a big deal. But the 14 feet. And our building was a brownstone building. So it was badly stained. And our, um, our board decided that we had to fix that. So they came in and they put a very thin coat of concrete on the bottom 14 feet of our building uh, to make the color match. And I'm going to come back to what, why that was a big problem. The other part that came out was that all of our records, and think about what a vault was like in that day. It was an all cash society. So when you go into that vault, the same one we have, there's, there's huge safety deposit boxes. Because uh, merchants would bring their wares in, their money in. Well, that, that all got flooded. So it was a terrible mess, as you can imagine. So our board told our management team that they had to make that vault waterproof. And when I came to the bank, and I got before that, in 1993, I kept looking at that vault, and there's an extension cord that comes out of that vault. 
And they said, how could the bank having this beautiful bulb have an extension cord? Well, that's the only way you get electricity into a watertight bulb. So to this day, that extension cord is there. Um, but uh, can I have the next slide? I'm, I'm afraid I'm... Okay, let me, let me talk about our lines. Um, you know, in 2005, 6, 7, 8, and 9, I went to our senior management saying, we can't allow our lines to deteriorate. They were cracking, it was falling apart, and the building didn't look good. And the problem was when you coat a brownstone with concrete, it can't breathe anymore. It's right. So what happens to the brownstone underneath it is it turns to sand. Mm -hmm. So our lines were just falling apart. So finally we made the decision, okay, figure out, Joe, how to restore these lines. Do you know how hard it is to find somebody in America that can restore lines? <laughs> but anyway, we found a group called McKay Lodge in Oberlin, Ohio. And if anyone wants to take a road trip to Oberlin, it is an arts community and it's got many, many artists there. But um, McKay Lodge came, and, and there's a video on YouTube. If you go to Dollar Bank's YouTube channel, there's a wonderful video about the restoration of the lions. But when the lions were taken down, they were put on a uh, flatbed. And it was first time since they were carved in situ by Max Kohler that they weren't facing each other. And I thought that was really a sad day. They were being taken away to be fixed, and uh, they weren't facing each other. The first thing they did to fix those lines was dump them into a vat of glue. Because you couldn't deal with the, the sandstone, the brownstone falling apart until it had been stabilized. And then they took uh, almost two years to restore them and get them back. And we used pictures from the Carnegie Museum because a fellow, I mean, McKay Lodge then put all the detail back into the line like it originally looked. But we were then informed, it was a shock to us, that the lions could not go back outside. So now we have a problem. Um, do you know how many places in America still can give you an eight-ton block of brownstone? The answer is zero. You can go to Germany, you can go to England, or you can go to China. So it became an issue of how do you match the color. China won, because they had the right color. Um, so eight, two eight-ton, we actually bought three blocks of sandstone. So we had to get it from China, to Connecticut, there was a crook in Connecticut that really held us up. So it took us another four to six months to get them. So we get them here, and then we have to send the blocks to one of the few master carvers in America named Nicholas Fairplay. And guess where he lived? Very convenient for us, Oberlin, Ohio. <laughs> uh, and what we had to do once our lions got restored was we brought a special truck in from California, and it took literally an MRI of that lion. So I have a lion pin on my, up here, yeah, it's still here. And that comes from that digital, we, we can make anything now from our lions because we've digitized them. So we have all different size lions now, and they are our lions. So Mr. Fairplay um, created a fiberglass model of our lions and then carved. The two new lions are exact replicas of our original lions. Now the other part of that story was, what do you do with the lions you've just restored? So I went to the zoo. The zoo was very happy to take both lions, as long as we had a check for $500,000 to restore the lion exhibit. That didn't quite seem right to me. Then we went to the Children's Museum. They were happy to take one, and we didn't want to lose, separate. So then we went to uh, the Carnegie Museum. And the museum was very excited about it, but they had those beautiful floors mm -hmm. in there. They were too heavy for the lions, so they couldn't take them. So lo and behold, happenstance, we decided to put the lions in the back. So when you come now, we have two sets of lions. But if you come into our Fourth Avenue branch, the lions are to your right and left if you come in. And the interesting thing is our floors couldn't withstand that weight. So we brought in some union representatives, the iron workers, and there is a superstructure that all goes all the way down to the, the foundation. If you come and take a tour, which I'm inviting you all to do, you will see that the iron workers have signed that superstructure that holds those lines up upstairs. Um, now, there's one other funny part, should you want to do it. If you come to Fourth Avenue, the line whose head's up, you will notice the back of the head is a little square. Well, apparently when they were carving the lion, this line up here on the left, uh, the block wasn't big enough. So they had to 
kind of fix the mane so it looked good. Now Mr. Fairplay decided he wanted to make the lion right. So the new lion is three inches longer and has a different mane. Slightly bigger mane. So kind of fun stuff. But you know, so that wasn't good enough for us because that cement layer caused the problem of all the columns. So we had a choice to replace the columns, imagine getting that amount of brownstone, or to do something called a Dutchman. Fortunately for us, we only had to go back in about eight inches until we were in a good stone. So the, once again, that 14-foot issue, if you come and look, you can kind of see the difference in coloration. So we went up to that area, we took out that part, and Mr. Fairplay, once again, to his credit, carved the bottom uh, roughly eight feet of our columns and did them in threes. So our columns are brand new. Now, so now we have new columns, we have new lions, but you know, the building isn't quite right either. <laughs> so cost construction, we brought them in and repointed the entire building. So what became a small project became a huge project, but it didn't end there because we decided the inside didn't look well, good enough. And then we, we stumbled upon all of our uh, ledgers. So now the inside has been completely restored. Fun fact about that building, um, we were concerned because when you got into the attic area, it was all black. And we thought that was dirt and dust. Turned out that building has iron rafters in it. So that was an effort to build, think about this, in 1870, a fireproof building. And the material that was put down there was really uh, insulated. So we didn't have to do anything to our attic. It was all in good shape. All right, what else do we have? I could go on and on about stories. Joe, I, I wanted to point out, excuse me, pardon, if you notice um, right there on the column that is being put on, that's the Dutchman that has just been installed. You'll notice there's no fluting on there. The reason is Nick Fairplay, oops, uh -oh. sorry, in order to get it to match, he wanted to carve the fluting in place after the Dutchman had been installed. Uh, so just for his plans, he had asked me to go count the flutes on the existing column. So I had to climb up on the ledge there and count the flutes on the columns going around the building. And I thought, this is probably one of the job aspects that I never counted on. <laughs> Very unusual of all the things I've done at the bank. That's one of the most unusual. So what do we have? Well, I know that, yeah, is that it? Or we're up again? Okay, uh, another fun story. <laughs> These are all true stories. Uh, this one was also written up in the Post Gazette. But um, Samuel Bailey, how many people have watched the movie It's a Wonderful Life? Probably everybody here, right? right. And what was that guy's name? Bailey. Bailey. George Bailey. Now, it's terribly ironic because Samuel Bailey was our. Uh, president from 1927 to 1931. What happened in Pittsburgh in 1931? Bank failures. Bank failures. The Bank of Pittsburgh, which is the parking garage that's the other side of the old Union National Building uh, on 4th Avenue that's now a parking garage and a Chinese restaurant, was the Bank of Pittsburgh. And it failed in 1931. It was the biggest bank in Pittsburgh. Well, Mr. Bailey recognized what was going on, so he ran downstairs to our vault. We had roughly a million dollars worth of cash and he placed it all in the center. That's the 1930s lobby. He placed it all in the center of the, of the bank. So when people came in thinking that dollar, they should get their money out of Dollar Bank, they realized we had lots of money. So we never had a rush of the bank, thanks to Mr. Bailey's quick thinking. You put it like in stacks behind glass? Yeah, when we, when we brought the Lions back, we had a big party. And I had people bring in what would have been a million dollars. It was a huge amount of coins and currency. You know, we never got anywhere near a million dollars, but it looked nice, you know. But Here's a security cage. I like a security cage. And we had cards. Um, so we now have the Heritage Center. Um, it basically walks through our history. Um, one of the fun things, I mean, people remember the uh, anniversary, was it the 200th anniversary of Pittsburgh? And they were trying to find the history of some of the mayors. Well, eight of the mayors of Pittsburgh were trustees of the bank. So we gave the city of Pittsburgh their whole history because we had it all, uh, which was kind of fun. Um, as I mentioned, last year we, we moved to, um, you know, we need to grow. We're at 8.6 billion, and the too big to fail under the um, 
laws from 2008-2009, the Dodd-Frank one in particular, basically too big to fail hits a $10 billion, which was a totally arbitrary number. But it really dramatically impacts the bank's finances. So we really need to position ourselves with no distinct plans to be able to grow because I want to go back to that capital issue. If you don't have a means for raising money, you have to use your capital. Mm -hmm. And if you use your capital, you can only use so much of it to keep your capital rating for safety and soundness. What you're showing here is some of our new branches. And you mentioned earlier, uh, has anybody been into any of the new um, Bank of America branches in the market? Well, over half of them, you walk in, there's no people. There's a video screen, and you're talking to somebody in Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, we were actually the first bank in the country to do that. Uh, we call them personal tellers. And we've really <laughs> learned that to put a personal teller machine in our branches is, is really not... <coughs> Not the best way to do it. We're still doing it. But all of our people there can also uh, be a teller for you. But for drive-throughs, you know, this is where you can come up to the machine, you push a button, there's a picture there of a person there. You talk to them. They can literally do 95% of what a teller can do. Um, and they can guide you through opening an account or complicated transaction. You can deposit mechanically up to 30 checks. At, at a, but the big thing, if you're interested in your money, is when you go into a branch, depending on the branch, Somewhere between 3 or 4 o'clock every day, that's the last time you can have good funds. Because after that, anything you deposit will be the next day. When you go to one of our electronic tellers, because it's all captured electronically, you can go as late as 8 o'clock at night and have good funds for the next day. So the technology works that way. But the movement to self-service in our industry is really, uh, as you would expect, um, you know, in my tenure, I've been here 27 years, we used to build five, 6,000 square foot branches. Our model today is 2,400 square feet. Mm -hmm. So, and drive through is king because you want the convenience and the extended hours. So, um, that really concludes our presentation tonight. We can answer any questions, but before you leave, I have a coin for everybody oh, nice. that is the dedication of our lions. It tells you the history of lions. And on the other side is the seal of the bank. When you look at it closely, uh, it's, it's a, it's, it's, um, what do you call it? Something, it's a, Liberty? Yeah, it's Lady Liberty. Lady Liberty. I always think Wearing a Native American headdress. That was the 1855 U.S. dollar gold coin. But those coins were made between uh, roughly 1846 to 1886. <coughs> there were three types. Type two, which was 1871 when our bank was built, was only put out for three years, and then they made a slightly bigger coin. Because these were solid gold coins that were smaller than a dime. So the biggest problem was everybody would lose their money. And after, you know, when the gold had to be melted down, when, the, when America wanted to get to the gold standard. Uh, but I, for years, have been asked, why do you have an Indian head above your front door? Because when you go into Fourth Avenue, this is what's above the front door. So now I have an answer. You know, I can tell them a different coin. But we have a coin. Anybody that does the tour of Fourth Avenue gets a coin. But I figured, you're all going to come to Fourth Avenue, so I'll give you a coin tonight. We'll, we'll have someone at the door to hand them out. And I have enough for everybody, so please. Any questions? And Dorothy will probably answer them. Yes? I have a question about the architecture of the 4th Avenue branch. When you look at it, it looks like it's got this big grand facade that would have been on a building, a block, the whole block or half the block. I mean, it looks like it's part of it. And, and now it looks like this kind of truncated facade. It's grand, but it's it's just the facade. It's almost like a museum. There was, a, a, was it always that? When the building was built, it was only the center portion in 1871, 1870, 1871. And the wings were built in 1904, 1905. There were two different architects. Isaac Hobbs was the original architect from Philadelphia, and that's Beaux-Arts style. And then James Steen, a local Pittsburgh architect, uh, designed the wings, but an architectural um, reviewer called that middle portion of the building, he said it's all doorway, right? <laughs> because it is highly decorative, and it was really one of the early Beaux-Arts exam building examples. Um, Hobbs really did a lot of residential architecture, this was one of his few commercial buildings, but it took the definition of Beaux-Arts would be a neoclassical structure and then they ornamented the heck out of it because they were Victorians. So there's a there's a huge amount of 
uh, classical motifs on the building. There's the columns and the entablature, which are classical structure, uh, but a, a lot of things like an upside down pineapple. The pineapple symbolizes welcome. There are canthus leaves all over at the base of the lions, at the base of the columns, at the tops, the column capitals. So uh, this building, by the way, we open it um, for Doors Open Pittsburgh weekend every year. And uh, it's actually one of the most popular tours. But uh, it is the oldest banking structure on 4th Avenue, surviving banking structure on 4th Avenue. I work in architecture and always worked in that neighborhood, so I was always really interested in what was going on. <laughs> It, it, yes, it's um, the center portion was uh, quarried in Portland, Connecticut, and the wings were the building, the brownstone for that, which is a slightly different color, was quarried in East Long Meadow, Massachusetts. So that's why you see a slight color differential between the center portion and the wings. Okay, thank you. Yes, any other questions? Yes. Um, you have oh, like that. Um, would, was there plans to put an entrance off of the Smithfield Street side? There is an entrance. We do. There is. I haven't been down there There is an entrance. We used to own the, what was the department store mm -hmm. um, that we, we, we uh, the building that is right around the corner from us on, on uh, Smithfield. We used to own that building. When we started growing, we moved our offices in there and kept 4th Avenue. So we still have the corridor from Smithfield. It's a long mm -hmm. hallway that goes into our branch. Mm -hmm. And that is a big part of our heritage center because that gives us an expansive wall to kind of tell, tell the story where inside the branch with all the marble and all the historic it's a little hard to do some of that so but we still have an interest with Smith. Uh, you loaned money uh, in mortgages nothing or not but uh, did you uh, loan money to uh, contractors to major builders in the city as well? We supported a lot of businesses uh, sometimes it's a little difficult for me to tell when I run across a loan in the cash books um, what the company is. On the occasions where I have been able to look up the companies, a lot of the ones that we were lending to were um, coal companies, um, uh, freight handlers on the rivers, and there were a couple of there were a couple of uh, construction companies. I think you may have heard of Booth and Flynn. That was one of the companies we loaned to as well. I would just point out to this day, if you take our top 50 customers, over 25 of them are developers. So we do an awful lot of real estate development. Uh, Wana Capital is a customer, Burns and Scala is a customer. So we still have an awful lot of uh, significant business relations. But our forte is real estate. Now, how many people, who, do, who is the biggest mortgage provider uh, in Western Pennsylvania? It's us. It's Dollar Bank. The largest is actually Bank of America because they buy loans. Number two is Howard Hanna because they originate loans. We're number three, but we're the only one that originates and keeps their loans. So uh, when you look at the numbers, our share market is, it's funny, we do extremely well in Pittsburgh, and I think we're number seven in Cleveland. But, um, and we're number 29 in America when you think of banks for lending. But our real strength is real estate when you look at what our expertise is. I'm the one right behind you. Oh. Yeah. I just wondered, you keep talking about tours. What are the hours and can you, how do you... Well, anytime you come in during our regular banking orders, hours, Greg, the branch manager, um, Vidmeyer, he will, and uh, Mr. Lee is also a, a docent. We have a series of docents that, that uh, Dorothy has trained. So you can put a tour together if you come. Just call and say you're coming. We're happy to do the tour. The Dollar Bank Heritage Center is open during business hours. It's free to the public. So um, Monday through Friday, and obviously doors open weekend. This lady is next. Yeah. Are there any Colton Airs still involved in the bank? Any in Pittsburgh Colton Airs? Colton Airs. No. They're at both no. families going. No, there are not. Yes. Do you envision putting any of the uh, depression year records online, or were you able to have access to a source other than the original to check history? You're, you're asking a very interesting question that we get asked quite a bit. The legal guideline is we're allowed to make uh, available records that are 75 years or older. So the 30s would qualify. I just don't think we've gotten that far. 
As far as customer records are concerned, our handwritten ledgers end around 1927. We have trustee minutes and um, cash books that go that continue after that. So we don't have, I don't have access to customer records that are outside of that handwritten collection. So that ends around 1927. Um, but we do have the cash books and trustee minutes. So I can tell you from the business end of it, from what the bank was doing, not necessarily who the customers were, uh, what was going on with the bank during the depression. Yes. Is there, was there a family named Veder, V-E-E-D-E-R? Veder? V-E-E-D-E-R. Were they one of the original uh, founders of the bank? There were 39 incorporating directors uh, with Mr. Colton who are named in the charter. I don't recall the name Veter being one of them. We actually have at 4th Avenue, when you go through the Heritage Center, there's a space called the Trustees Ante Room, and all the trustees, all the directors who served on the board since the bank began, their names are on gold-lettered panels uh, there in the Trustees Ante Room. So, that's actually a good place to check for reference, and it is current and up to date. I just noticed someone being added, like, recently, fairly recently. Yes? Was there, can you say anything about the origin of Dollar's name, or, it's, uh, or where the lines came from? Or? The origin of Dollar's name, when we were chartered in 1855, our original name was the Pittsburgh Dollar Savings Institution, and Pittsburgh, the way we spelled it in our charter, did not have an H. You know there's a whole battle about Pittsburgh's H. Yeah, the <laughs> anyway, the, the, the dollar, the word dollar in our name has continued because of the importance of making the bank affordable to working people. And what working people had at the time was around, for the wages for unskilled labor were about 90 cents a day. So roughly a dollar a day for a 12 hour shift and making a, it available for them to earn at the time 6% on their savings, which was the same rate of dividends that a wealthy professional could earn. So when we changed our name, when the bank changed its name in 1858, we um, submitted a name change request to the County of Allegheny and got back an approval um, with the seal of the county on it. Our name was then changed in 1858 to Dollar Savings Bank. That was the name that we had until 1984 when we became Dollar Bank. So we've only ever had three names, but the word dollar has always been there because of our roots, because of our, uh, you could open an account, anyone could open an account with as little as one dollar. I have a gift for Michael because he put this all together for us. So. Can anybody take a guess what it might be? Show what you got. We like our lions. Buy them in the gift shop. Yeah. <laughs> That's a nice line. Oh, wow. And that is our line. Thank you all very much. And it was really a pleasure to come speak to you tonight. And we're so lucky to have Dorothy because you know who did all the work. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's a great evening. All right. Please take your chairs over there and then come get a gold coin over here. Um,